So welcome uh, this morning or afternoon, based on where you are. Um, this is part of a, a series that we do here at uh, the Center for Open Science that uh, in effect is, is sponsored by one of our, our projects, uh, OSF Institutions, which is uh, a product, a suite of features on the OSF for uh, research institutions of all kinds. Um, and today we're gonna highlight a diverse set of, of collaborations uh, across open science that really involve a lot of different uh, parties. And so let's take a look at some of these that we're gonna have sharing today. Whoops, too far. Um, so the PressQT infrastructure project is gonna share, Natalie, Noel, Rick, and Sandra. Um, we'll hear a little bit about e uh, each of these uh, individuals and projects here in just a couple minutes. Um, the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base, uh, Marcy Reedy will share a little bit about that. Uh, the Center for Information Technology and Architecture, uh, Adrian Rigabello is our guest uh, from the center. And then the Center for uh, Open Science ourselves uh, as, as the host, I will wrap up with a little bit of uh, OSF institutions information. And, and one of the really exciting things about working here at the center and with uh, OSF institutions in particular is that while these techno technology, the, the products that we work on uh, is you know, obviously a, a big part of what we do. Uh, another really huge component of our work is working and, and speaking and sharing with really neat projects and individuals like these. So really uh, appreciate having the opportunity to have them there, uh, in, them come and join us today, um, but also just generally being able to, to host activities like these is, is really a pleasure. I'm gonna give you the, the 90 second version of uh, what the center is for some of you who may um, not be as familiar with the center and some of the things we do. Uh, generally, our mission is to increase the openness, integrity, and reproducibly, reproducibility of, of research. And uh, obviously that's a big, huge, broad goal with lots and lots of uh, culture and behavior change uh, involved. And so we're structured to really uh, take on that mission in from three directions. Um, we have a policy team that works with publishers and funders and many other uh, bodies to um, create or encourage incentives for change. Um, we have a research team who studies things like the current incentives or new incentives or new uh, projects to see if those are actually encouraging the, the work that we are, are hoping, uh, the changes we're hoping to see. And then the infrastructure uh, projects that um, I myself work with um, that builds technology to enable those things that we're really um, asking uh, folks to, to embrace as culture change. Um, so with that, uh, part of what I'm tasked with is not just sharing what OSF and what COS is doing, but really great practices across open science with our partners globally. Um, so really, really thrilled to have um, some of our participants here today, uh, uh, just a few of the very, very many that I would, would love to highlight at some point. Um, so to start with uh, the PressQT project, it's going to share a little bit uh, about their project, which itself is uh, a technical and, and cultural collaboration. Uh, so Sandra, you want to take it away? So do you see my screen? Yep, we sure can. Great. So I can Start. So yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm Sandra Gazing. I'm one of the co-PIs of the PressQT project. And I hope you still see me because I get messages that I cannot access the microphone. You still hear and see me? Yep. Good. <laughs> Error messages during a talk, great. <laughs> we are seeing uh, your presentation uh, presentation mode okay swap your you know what let me instead of trying no i didn't say and oh okay i know i have another slideshow in the back i maybe just keep it at the full, so let's say presenter view. No, I didn't want that. Give me one 
one more five seconds. <laughs> Let me. Slideshow. If you do the play from yeah. current slide, yes. oh, there you go. <laughs> I got it. I got it. So. So yeah, and Rick is also on the call. He's one of the co-PIs for PressQT. Yeah. Um, Eric mentioned Natalie and John are co-PIs. Noel and Justin are developers for the PressQT project are both on the call. And Brad is also a developer who couldn't join today. So what is PressQT about? Um, if you look at the yeah, research data management and with the preservation landscape and the science gateways and workflow um, enabled user interfaces. We have these really beautiful solutions, but sometimes they are not connecting to each other. And, you know, like also with apps, with, and PressQT is there to build bridges between systems. So the idea is really we, we got first a planning grant and then an implementation grant to, to collaboratively design, develop, and connect repositories and um, data and software preservation quality to increase the quality of software preservation and data preservation. So if we, we look at the timeline, so the concept is that we look first um, at the community, we asked in so the big survey, we had workshops to get feedback, how the tool design should look like. And, um, and then we looked at the different tools and services we would like to develop and co-develop with, with partners. And really on the stakeholder side, we looked at the main researchers, data curators, repository managers, librarians, software developers, workflow tool developers. <laughs> yeah, you can see the list. And I hope one of these expressions or more uh, you feel also targeted by that this could be interesting for you and um, yeah one of our partners is OSF and the concept is that the, that these are not standalone solutions what we are developing but that really partner systems and services can be easily integrated so if you look at the nice little circle so we have a core team we have partners on you have extended community being able to really use this and the yeah, user-centered open design and collaborative development is really important to us. So we have the stage that we have a couple of services. So additional partner system can be configured via JSON and Python functions. We transfer data in Bagit format and all the metadata is added in JSON. We do already fixity checks, um, keyword enhancement, and we started this testing for FAIR. And FAIR is especially also interesting, not only because it's a big topic at the moment, the community, but it's also what does FAIR really mean? How can you test it that something is really findable and, yeah, interpretable? And so, and we have this pluggable, yeah, configurable architecture, it's RESTful web services, um, we are going to API and, um, and a consideration of diverse structures. And why are we doing this this way? Because the feedback and also the idea is that nobody has to leave their working computational environment, but has additional features. So, and to see, for example, we look at different things. If we have the current target integrations include OSF, Curate ND is a Fedora derivative we are using at NodeDem, GitHub, Synodo, GitLab, Figshare, and we can search there, we can download, upload, transfer. So the upload and transfer is in work at the moment at Curate ND. And we support also e um, services like Easy or Keyword Enhancement. So um, I'm happy to go into more detail if you have questions about easy. But for the moment, I would say I give it to Justin to, to make a short demo. And I start, or I stop sharing the screen.
I'll just, um, you probably can take over. Sounds good. Um, you guys can see the PressQT interface here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so let's do a transfer from OSF to Zenodo. Um, for PressQT, we use API tokens from each target um, as validation or authentication. Um, so we can see here the OSF resources I have for this particular user is just the three there. Um, for the demo, let's transfer this one. Um, you can also click through and see what's inside every project. You can download individual files, just folders, um, upload to folders or different projects, create new projects. Um, for this demo, we're going to transfer this COVID-19 project to Zenodo. Uh, we'll use our Zenodo token there. Um, in Zenodo, I just have this one project, uh, which you can see over here. Um, I could transfer into that project uh, by selecting the folder. Um, for this demo, we're just going to create a new project. Um, it'll ask what you want to do with duplicate resources not really relevant for a new upload, but if you were going in somewhere where it found a file with the same checksum, it would ask whether you want to update a file or, or just ignore it. Um, and then we have our keyword enhancement feature uh, built into the transfer process. Um, so what this will do is it will gather um, keywords over here in OSF. You can see in this project we have animals and water as um, some keywords. Uh, we run that through uh, SciGraph API, which offers us uh, enhancements. And we can go through and select uh, ones we want to add to our project. So we'll select those. And then before we transfer, uh, we just give you a few details about what is going to take place. So we're going to transfer the resource to Zenodo as a new project. It'll create a metadata file at the top level. Um, and since we're also doing keyword enhancements, um, it will write a metadata file to OSF as well, um, just to let you know how those keywords were added to the project. Um, it says where the keywords will be stored in each target. Um, OSF only provides checksums for OSF storage files. Um, this particular project um, just has files in OSF storage, so that's good. And uh, COVID-19 will be written in Bagot format as a zip file. Now this is specific to Zenodo as it's a, a finite um, target. Um, if we were going to say GitHub or GitLab or, or transferring something to OSF, they have um, infinite uh, structure capabilities. But since Zenodo is uh, one top level a uh, project that contains files, uh, we have to zip up everything we're bringing over. Uh, just to just to make sure that 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 hierarchy is is consistent with with what it was at the source. Um, so this will will download. It'll create a zip to be passed over to Zenodo. Um, once it's successful, you can see we updated over here. We've got. Uh, our new Zenodo resource, um, the keywords that were added. Uh, so if we refresh our OSF project, we can see that those keywords have been added. We've added this, this metadata file um, that has information about um, the ID of the action that took place, when it took place, um, and the keywords that were added based on this SciGraph enhancer. And over here in Zenodo, um, we've got the COVID-19 project. Um, you can go through and add um, all the information that Zenodo needs before you were to publish. Um, this metadata file is based on the zip that was created on the PressQT server. Um, and if we open the zip uh, that we've uploaded, 
Let me just move my Zoom stuff there. Um, this metadata file has information about each individual uh, file that came from OSF. And then all the files are inside OSF storage. And we can see that all the files passed their fixity checks and the transfer was successful. And Great. that is all. Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, so the idea with TresQT is that we have shown the user interface, which we have for demo purposes. But the idea is really that it's integrated in your science gateway, in your in OSF, in different solutions that people can really say, oh, I can use it directly to transfer files securely and with fixity checks to another system, but also add keywords. And the next, what I said was what we are working at the moment on is really to do fair tests that you can get an idea like, oh, how, how fair is my data I have already in OSF or in Curate ND or um, in another science gateway like Hive Zero. And then you get a hint what, what could be, you know, maybe improved or what do you gain if you put it in a preservation system, but you might lose on, on the fair scale of data. So that's the idea behind it. So um, yeah, it helps with transferring data that people don't um, have to do first the download in one system and upload in a preservation system, but can do it seamlessly and also between different working environments. Any questions for me there? We're going to go ahead and, and just go through all of our speakers, Sandra, and then we'll come back and do some questions. So well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. And uh, we're going to now just go right over to our next speaker, and that's going to be Marcy to talk about the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Justin and Sandra, that was fascinating. Um, really appreciate you, you sharing with us. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so yes, thank you so much for joining everyone. Um, I'm going to put in a link, actually, excuse me, let me get back to the Zoom link here. To put in a link to the knowledge base. Do, do, do. I can do that for you, Marcy. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. I, I, as I put my um, um, the link in, it, it removes my, my PowerPoint. So thank you so much. Appreciate your time, everyone. Um, the exciting thing about the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base, or OSKB, um, that we're calling, calling it um, for short, um, so this is hot off the presses. Um, we're just releasing it now. We're really excited about it. So this is such an exciting, important time um, to have this discussion with you on this webinar um, with um, really, really recent information. Um, I have put in the link to the knowledge base itself. So I invite you to click on that um, as I'm speaking, um, maybe click around, browse around, um, see what you think. Um, I'm just going to go on a high level um, description to answer some of the most common questions, but the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base was um, built around the knowledge and understanding that open scholarship can be challenging, especially for people that don't have the tools or the background knowledge um, to really understand. They may want, may want to enter into it, but not um, necess necessarily know how to start. 
So the concept was, let's create a platform that can ease that transition for them. Let's make this as easy as possible, um, building in an interface where um, resources were searchable, they were accessible, it was easy to, um, to upload and to, to have a discussion about them, and um, very, very searchable. Um, um, for the people that were working on it. Um, so that's, that's what it is. It is a um, platform knowledge base um, that allows anyone that is searching for educational resources um, to access them um, very efficiently and easily. Um, the, this is a list of the resources gathered in collections, um, as you can see here. Um, to help organize and collate them into ways that will make it easier for the user, um, as I was saying, that's coming in to search for these resources. Um, so if we use the analogy of a library, um, this is an online library collection. Um, the, the collections are the, book or the bookshelves that are there, organized by various topics that someone may go into the library and look um, for different resources they're needing, um, analysis, data, education, policy, publishing, reproducibility, research methods, um, to help ease that, that search. Um, this is an example of a resource um, that is included in one of these collections. Um, so, for instance, if someone was looking for a statistics um, curriculum and, and syllabus that they could use to help help teach, they could go in there. This is learning statistics with R, um, and they could find, find something to support them. Um, we realized um, the need for a searchable database like this, um, you know, years ago, of course, but never did we really anticipate um, the flood and the demand um, that we have right now, considering everyone is looking for online resources and everyone is looking for um, educational materials to support online instruction. Um, so this is, again, coming at a, at a critical time. Um, another resource, um, just to share as an example of what you might may find available. Um, I'm a Harry Potter fan, so this is an article that's looking at the um, um, Harry Potter methods of reproducibility. Um, you know, kind of fun and interesting. So, if someone was was looking to introduce um, the concept of reproducibility um, to their their class, they could could go online and, and find this article to share. Um, so I've talked about how the OSKB is an online platform that makes resource, resources easily searchable, and, and it is, um, but what differentiates it is that it is a lot more than that. Um, it's, it is a very community-based tool, um, so this isn't just a um, technological tool that is remote and removed online like this is grounded in the community um, there's discussions there's um, interchange among scholars um, it was conceived of and designed by the community and it's based in the community so we really want it and, and we really wanted to serve the community needs um, so that is a underlying and non-negotiable principle um, underpinning the OSKB. Um, these are some of the groups um, that also are created um, within the OSKB um, that enable that interchange and dialogue among the community members. So if we return to the library analogy, these groups um, would these groups of users would be the tables that are assembled around the library study tables of of, of users and and people that were um, discussing and talking and and learning together about a topic so this is another way to help facilitate the organization of the the platform into user groups that are have similar needs are looking for similar resources have similar questions that they can exchange with each other. And um, these educators um, and researchers and librarians and, and, and everyone can, can help monitor their group 
and make the group usable and the most um, effective for them um, so they can help um, edit content, they can help suggest content, they can look for content gaps um, to say, hey, we need more here, um, and, and really um, leave, leave good feedback and input for their other colleagues all around the world. Um, the why, um, you know, have talked a little bit about this and, you know, with the recent um, uh, demand for online curriculum, of course, the why is, is even more in demand, but um, we recognize how quickly resources um, go out of date and they can be hard to find and there are barriers to entry um, and talk about this. So we wanted to, to find a platform that that eliminated or minimized those those barriers um, and to um, really um, ease that that usability um, for the widest um, largest number of groups. Um, again, this talks about how the interface is designed to make it as easy as possible, the collections. Um, we also have some detailed contributor guides. Um, if you go to the OSKB, that really has a um, detailed list of how you can submit resources. So the options are you either submit resources um, from the web, an existing resource, or you can author an original resource. Um, and it, it goes detailed step by step with that. Um, here, part of authoring a resource, um, you can see, and um, um, previously, um, the presentation talked about the metadata that, that went through and keywords searchable. Um, a lot of that is, is included here. Um, I just included this as a um, general depiction to kind of get the type of information that we're searching for or that we're looking for um, when um, content is uploaded. Um, so, you know, of, of importance is choosing a license. Um, you know, how is this? Is it open access? Is it um, Creative Commons? Um, you know, putting author attributions, um, you know, widely within the work. Um, again, adding the metadata so people can easily find the resources. Um, tagging the audience members and the groups so that it can be matched to those that were best, best needed. Um, and all of this is part of what the community will help to monitor and regulate and make sure that um, that information is accurate and um, um, and in meeting the needs. Um, here is a flowchart that describes the process um, from beginning to end. Um, if you're, I won't go into um, much detail. Um, but um, interested in submitting a resource um, of how a user would um, would enter there, they would upload from the portal. Um, it walks you through step by step, but um, there is a checklist of materials um, that are acceptable. Um, it's hosted on OER Commons, so following their um, their guidelines, um, then you check the license. Um, make sure it is open access. You find a group that it belongs to and contributed it. Um, then it goes to an admin um, review um, that looks and makes sure that the material is appropriate for that group, um, that it is a, an open, open license and um, is properly categorized. And after that um, is, is completed, it will finally be, be published and made available. Um, so, with that broad um, um, overview, um, wanted to give different points for how people can be involved. Um, we really, really encourage you to join this community and be active. Um, of course, you can submit resources. Um, please um, join in. Um, there's a the bit.ly link. Um, if you have your own resources or if you know of others that you might be able to upload um, and, and share with other authors. Um, it, the broader, the most diverse community we can get, the, the stronger it will be. Um, help us promote, though, as could be among your networks. Um, if you hear someone that's looking for educational resources, looking for something to supplement the instruction, um, please let them know. And um, critically, um, consider being a hub or group administrator. Um, that flowchart that I showed um, 
where it's a group and admin approving the resources that were submitted um, is a critical, critical component of the hub. So if you have a couple hours a week and are interested, um, we would love you to, to join our, um, our team. So in addition, um, we are having some training sessions that are going to go into the details of what I did broad level. Um, the intro to open educational resources and practices and contributing high quality OER. Um, we invite you to join these, these trainings and, and learn more about how um, the value of OER and open educational resources, um, how you might be able to utilize them and how um, you can contribute those to, to a larger community. Um, so we hope you will, will join us in doing that. And with that, I will turn it back to Eric and say thank you so much for your time. All right, thanks so much, Marcy. So uh, our last uh, speaker yeah. today, Adrian, can tell us a little bit about CETA. So if you can stop sharing, Marcy, so that he can start. Mm -hmm. Go. Hi everyone, thank you Eric, thank you everyone that I'm really uh, uh, looking forward to see, I mean to participate actually in the OSKB uh, project, it seems really useful and, and nice. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. so I will quickly introduce um, our activity here in the Center for uh, Information Technology and Architecture uh, down in the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, so basically the project that we are uh, starting to work with with uh, OSF is called Songhead Architecture. I'm going to very quickly introduce it. Um, oops. Um, but prior to the, to the project, basically I just wanted to, to show some uh, context. Uh, so basically the goal of the project is to uh, um, research and provide insight on building a fungal automaton at the architecture of scale. So it's a European project uh, with four um, partners of which one industrial, Mogu, uh, and so we have um, CETA, which I'm part of, uh, Utrecht and, and Bristol also. Um, so obviously we are based in, uh, in uh, Europe um, and just far enough for the COVID to separate us as it's transnational. Um, just uh, to, to introduce quickly to have a feeling of what CETA is doing. Um, so basically we are uh, doing what is commonly called uh, in our domain um, computational design, uh, which means that uh, looking through material properties, um, so structural thermal engineering, or different types of um, explicit data sets that we can get. Um, we are looking at, in a way, how to creatively use them in order to enhance architectural experiences. Um, so for example, um, in such a project with uh, involving pneumatics, um, there is obviously a notion that very much architectural to say um, like form finding or um, eventually also uh, lots of projects in computational design can refer to uh, optimization of resources, for example. This one here that you see um, involves computational design as um, computational geometry. For example, here, like a research on how to actually build those um, artifacts. And then uh, the bottom image is um, how do we, once we've built it, how do we analyze it, how do we uh, compare the model to the realization and so on. Um, and just as an example, another project here is uh, looking at the, say, creative formation of, um, of uh, aluminum panels, I think it was aluminum, um, in order to um, and, uh, or optimize material usage. For example, in this case, obviously as a bridge. So talking a bit more about fungal architectures, basically uh, fungal involves uh, mycelium. So it's the 
kind of the root system of uh, mushrooms. And it has been explored uh, for, um, for example, here by the agency, the, the, sorry, the studio uh, The Living, with a 12 meters um, tower made of bricks. And now what we are looking at is basically making something a bit more monolithic and alive, actually. So that's um, also why we, we, we are working with several partners, uh, because it's a fairly complex topic. And basically, we are also in part of the, the project um, is that we are working with nature. So eventually, with non-protectable uh, knowledge, in a way. So obviously, open source is at the core of the, the project. Um, so in terms of structuration, uh, as I guess most uh, trans uh, organization of a research project, we have different levels of uh, dissemination opportunities. So for example, there is obviously a rather big uh, biodesign community, biohacking community that already exists, and that uh, is a, at the time a kind of a strategic partner, informal strategic partner to the project, and also um, a beneficiary to, this, uh, to the outcomes of the, of the project. Obviously, among the, the, the members also, there are also collaborations happening, even if different partners work on different sides of the project, trainings also, uh, depend on, uh, that are shared between the, the, the different partners. Um, and the framework of the funding that we have, which is uh, Horizon 2020 uh, Future and Emerging Technologies funding, um, the funding is uh, also uh, implying the production of open, um, sorry, I, I can't, okay. no, I can't see part of the screen, but basically it's open hardware, open software, and open data. So it's not somehow mandatory to produce it or to disseminate it within the project, but it should be um, um, to some extent uh, part of the larger dissemination of the project. So it's a very important, uh, both naturally and uh, funding related, it's a very important uh, side of, uh, of, uh, of the project to us. And that's the, the most um, relevant image I found to, in order to explain my, my feeling about OSF is that with all these different practices ranging from amateurs doing biodesign in their uh, garages up to um, the mycology department, uh, in uh, Utrecht, uh, we have a very um, different set of tools and methodologies to work through. And I find that um, OSF so far, I'm sorry about the blur, uh, but I guess that you all know this kind of page, um, but uh, eventually what's interesting is that within the same project, so here you can barely see it, but I guess that you also have this experience maybe that with the different components, we can segregate the different partnerships that we have with different um, institutions or even individuals or different communities, which is a, a very critical point for us in terms of dissemination. Um, and so again, if you started to, to, to use uh, OSF, you know that there are um, quite a long list of, uh, of uh, add-ons and interfaces that you can uh, um, activate, enable, both for storage and, and citation, uh, which are um, to us very important, obviously, because some of our, some members of our communities will use uh, GitHub, or um, for example, also from the early description of the activities of our lab at CETA, you could probably understand that we are managing both, uh, I don't know, if data sets in forms of CSV files, for example, and also 3D scans, and also uh, uh, protocols for making um, mycelium composites, for example. So we have a large nature of um, the, um, data, I would say, that, that we are managing. And this is quite critical and very uh, something that, that we find very useful in OSF. And the, the fact that it's allowing us to have this one interface um, for different communities. Um, Okay, so I'm sorry, it's, it's not a voluntary blur, but um, 
here, uh, basically, if we look at one component, uh, for example, we are using the wiki as a basic to-do list, but it's very useful for us because then we have also the files that are up to date below. Obviously, uh, people within our organization have also access to the different cloud services. Um, and beyond this quite basic feature, uh, something that is also determining for us is the, the citation. And yeah, I mean, when we are talking about biodesign communities, for example, and people that are in third places, um, it can be that people are not always constant, constantly producing academic publications. So this is also a way for us, um, both in for our activities and also to, to um, um, I mean, if uh, a non-academic partner would say uses um, OSF, it can, I mean, the person can be cited also in further works, um, eventually by academic peers. So this is also um, a very nice integration for us. Um, and I would just like to, uh, to, to talk a bit about that uh, very quickly. So basically now we are just um, into the process of starting teaching activities that are related to our research project, fungal architecture project. Um, so for example, uh, I mean, we haven't tested the way of uh, interfacing with the students. Is it view only links? Uh, do they need to create accounts in order to document their projects uh, on the, the platform? That's something that we need to mature a bit and uh, hopefully uh, um, share our insights, uh, uh, say in a month or two. Um, um, actually, today with uh, with some some fellows in the lab, we were talking also about the fact that they, are, they just adopted paper file um, for citation uh, management I mean, for bibliographic management. So that's another one that could be interesting. Um, uh, we've been talking a bit also with Eric about uh, dissemination metrics um, that might be also useful uh, for uh, for researchers to to highlight. Um, and so, yeah, I would just like, I mean, it's not really in the order, but the, the time management of tasks also could be interesting because, uh, for example, we are using a very simple Trello board in order to track our experiments in the lab. Obviously, it comes nicely with, uh, with uh, the task management, the reminders that they are there, that uh, the fact that we can assign labels and so on, it, I mean, it's a bit visual as well. That's something that's, um, in use here and that could be interesting and the fact that i mean you quite understood that we are doing also something that is uh, both with explicit data set and with um, eventually a more qualitative or tacit data set in a way <laughs> if i may say so uh, so for example we do have a use for um, uh, mood boards for example um, like more visual uh, uh, sorting and intuitive sorting of, uh, of uh, information. So that could be eventually another thing to add in order to have another kind of typology of tool to be interfaced with. And that's about it. If you have any question, I would be glad to answer. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Adrian. And I, I just take the opportunity as he just mentioned this. Um, yeah, he and I had, <clears throat> excuse me, had talked a few weeks ago about some of these uh, elements that he just called out there, and that's what I'm here for. So anybody, if you want to come and chat with me about the things, the practices that you have, the tools that you use, uh, and you could see value in whether they interact with OSF already or not, or maybe they interact by way of PressQT or similar tools, let's talk about it, because the only way I can uh, can improve in those directions is uh, I know what you need and what you use. So please, please do come and talk to me about that. And my uh, contact info will be in these materials um, that you'll you'll get later today or tomorrow. Um, Sandra, I see you, you posted a, a question for Adrian. You want to go ahead and articulate that one? Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you both, Marthy and Adrian, for great talks. Um, so one question I would have, Adrian. I mean, this looks fantastic, interesting. So. So when you said, oh, open hardware, and I only know that we have the situation that people yeah, like their tools and they want to try it. And therefore, for example, a partnership with hotel 
which is an, ex yeah, an extension of the OSIF framework to also be able to start tools. So is this something you would be maybe interested in that would be dockerized? Um, because sometimes the problem is just, <laughs> I come from the EU, you hear my accent. <laughs> Originally from Germany. So, so I know how it goes normally with the EU project in that regard. So can you collaborate on, let's say, putting tools and jobs from outside the EU on hardware? Um, that's a good question. I think so, because it's not, I mean, there is nothing specified about that. Um, it, I think it's, um, I mean, there is no, up to my knowledge, at least, <laughs> there is no notion of uh, competitiveness or closeness, closeness um, exclusiveness to, to European uh, partners. And actually, it's, uh, um, from our perspective, the, say, the, the communities that we are engaged with are located also in the US. I wouldn't say, unfortunately, worldwide for now, but um, <laughs> also in the US for sure. Um, okay, so, cool. Yeah, for sure, yeah. So that, yeah, so maybe you could stay in contact and talk about a couple of things there. That, that would be great. For sure, with pleasure. Great. Love to see things come together right here. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so I do, I have a question um, for both Sandra and uh, Marcy, and start with Sandra here, but um, you guys are in two phases, two different phases of a similar quest where you, there is a technology of some variety, but you determined early, uh, much to our excitement, that uh, it's not technology that you build and hope that people come to it. It's, it's community driven and determined. So what did that look like um, at the beginning uh, for, for each of you? Um, in sort of shaping what the, the direction of the, the product or the, the initiative was going to be? Yeah, um, for, for PressKT, we really wanted to see what the community wants. So we, we did the workshops. We had um, in total two big workshops, um, gathering from different stakeholders feedback and really asking questions like, what kind of preservation systems do you use? What kind of gaps do you have? What kind of, you know, what, what do you really need? And it was often very clear that people were like, okay, yes, I, I know there are preservation systems, but how do I get my files there in a convenient way, for example? How can I increase the data which is available? The other thing was our big uh, survey. So we got, um, 1,400 answers, which gave us a lot, lot of insights um, what to do. So therefore we selected the features and it was also very clear there, people have their own environments and um, to add another environment means another hurdle. So that was then the idea to say, okay, we, we are the bridge behind the scenes. But the bridge behind the scene is hard to show without a demo user interface. <laughs> so therefore, we showed the demo user interface. And we are also happy if someone says, you know what, I have this system and I, I work with it, but I'm fine with working with the, the demo user interface because it would mean more work on my side to integrate PressQT. So there's no problem to use the user interface. It's just yeah, it, it depends what people want. So that that was, we had the surveys and the workshops and went from there. And the other, since it's an open um, process, development process, all the partners, everyone who's interested can contribute. So for example, we have every two weeks a community call who wants to join, who wants to give us feedback or say what they want, um, everyone can contribute. We are, before we are integrating features, we're making suggestions to the partners that we plan it like this, and then partners can come back with their feedback or say, oh, they would prefer other features or, yeah. So it's a very open process involving all the partners and the community from the beginning. Yeah, that's such a critical question, Eric. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and 
to echo what Sandra was saying, um, just, just really we had a similar approach um, and um, was instrumental in launching the OSKB. Um, we, as you pointed out, it wasn't so much that we had this idea for a tool and then we wanted to convince the community that it was worth their time and their effort, um, wanted to start with the community first, um, discover what they um, needed and then build the tool to meet those needs. Um, so at the very beginning, um, we, um, or the development team outlined reasons why we may fail um, with the OSKB. And one of the reasons was a lack of diversity um, among the community. Um, we wanted to, above all, make it a very, very warm and welcoming space um, for everyone. So we wanted this, um, this platform and this interchange to have um, uh, diversity all across it with the ideology and the disciplines that we didn't want it to be pigeonholed or sh or where some disciplines were overrepresented among others and we wanted to have a diverse group of administrators um, with their backgrounds and their ethnicity to, to make sure that all viewpoints were heard and, and represented among that community and it really was was at the, the heart of it because um, we wanted that that open resource to be to be open for all and if it really was reaching segments of the community and and educators that um, were really kind of already served or were already working within the open access space or already felt welcome in the open access space then it wasn't really meeting a need um, because that community had what they needed um, so we wanted to um, expand that and, and push those boundaries and bring in new people. So that's the continuing search um, is expanding the community. Yeah, that's outstanding for both answers are, are really exciting because that's a, really a foundational belief for us here at the center. Um, you know, the community really is coming first. So um, you know, for, for anything that you've heard today, uh, I think um, all of us would would love to hear your your feedback um, and want to talk to you about how whether you want to contribute or or just have um, uh, something you want to to share that may be relevant. Um, please do come and and talk to us. So the, just the last few minutes here, I'm going to share uh, a feature that uh, is part of the OSF Institutions uh, suite of tools that I mentioned um, earlier. So this is on our, our staging environment of the OSF, which um, you know looks and works the same as the OSF here. Uh, and for some of you, you already have uh, dabbled or, or been part of OSF institutions for some time, um, then you recognize uh, the ability to affiliate projects with your institutions, your, your labs, your universities, um, for their, your researchers, which is a really neat feature and, and what uh, the, the data that's been building up around all of your researchers participating and affiliating their data, um, what we can do is build a, a dashboard for each of those members now. And this is in production. I'm going to show you a staging one today just so I'm not revealing anybody's real data. Um, but what uh, the dashboard does is gather all of those users that are participating and have uh, enabled those affiliations. Uh, so you can see everyone on campus who's, who's taking part is on OSF. You can see what kind of public project work they're doing. You can even see a, just a raw count of their private projects. You can't see their, their private projects, obviously. Um, a total count of, of users so you can, you can track and see how progress is going on campus with your outreach and advocacy for, for these tools. Um, this updates every single night so you can, can see it on a micro level if you really need to. Um, we can also, based on how your identity management works, uh, determine each user's department. This isn't self-reported, it's something that the university has metadata for um, that they may or may not release to third parties. Uh, but if they do release that, then we can also associate users 
with their departments and you can sort and narrow down by those uh, department levels so you can see where you have clusters of activity and we'll vis visualize that too. So if you have a, an area of campus, um, so in, in a case like Adrian's, one of his partners, University of Bristol, their architecture program does a big push to, to get their work onto OSF. You can actually find your architecture program on here and see how that grows over um, you know, a month or a couple of months. And then a total uh, project count for um, and determining or distinguishing between public work and, and private work. Um, so this is available now in production. Um, so I'm happy to chat with anybody that uh, has an interest in, in learning more about institutions, uh, OSF institutions generally, or just the OSF and how it uh, enables some really cool information for uh, institutions to, to learn a little bit more about the kind of activities that researchers are doing that are kind of hard to to distinguish um, without some some tools that support that data gathering. So um, I'm just going to quickly check to see if we had any questions pop up in the meantime. I don't think so. Um, but to keep a lookout for a follow up with uh, all of this material that we went over today. Um, and you'll have my contact information and um, please do feel free to, to reach out to us and um, Oh, we're going to see one more question. Um, go ahead, Sandra. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Marcy, one, one question. Do, do you see maybe also the possibility that people when they're using your knowledge base are like, oh, I would like to have this in another system, this article, for example, in, in my um, instance of a preservation system or my instance of, you know, transferring mm -hmm. data somewhere else? Because that would be, yeah. Yeah, we certainly, um, sure, would love to be able to form those interchanges. Um, we haven't um, created that capability just yet or um, some of the technological connections to, to do that. But the degree to which um, in the metadata and all of the information created, um, the authors and the users can upload and then put attributions and links and sources and referencing back yeah. um, is strongly, strongly encouraged. Um, so that you, those, those network of connections and, and you know, lines between everyone engaging in this work um, can be clearly drawn. Great. Yeah, maybe we also should <laughs> follow up because you could talk about that you could use PressQT for mm -hmm. getting it, for example, into Synodo or in other systems. Just saying, yeah, great. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Another example of collaboration in real time. <laughs> yeah, that's outstanding. Really, that's, that's great. Thank you, every, uh, thank you all of you, the speakers, all of you that came and joined us. Uh, to listen in. Um, really looking forward to, to conversations that this can inspire. So uh, keep a look out for, for more material. Uh, and thanks again for joining.